Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of fantasy romance and romantic fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Superb. Today is Tuesday, April 26th. I'm indoors again. It's cold. It's only like, um, well, now it's up to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a cold wind blowing. So indoors. After this, do I keep saying this? I feel like I keep saying it to David. After this, it's supposed to warm up. Although maybe we're supposed to get a big thunderstorm tomorrow afternoon. Wouldn't that be nice? Ah. So um, things are, feel like they're going well. Knock on wood, knock on real wood. Um, the book is progressing nicely. I, I don't think I mentioned, but I have upped my word count slightly to going for 2,500 words a day and seeing how sustainable that is. Um, for those of you who have not been keeping avid track of everything that I do, um, I finally had decided that what I'd been saying for so long that I write 3000 words a day, five days a week was actually a lie and that I don't write that much on a consistent basis. And that maybe it was over time draining, draining the creative well and leaving me feeling brain dead, tired and sneezy. Hold on a moment didn't want to sneeze in your ears. So I'd looked back to see what my actual average was and it does work out to more like 2000 words a day, five days a week, 10,000 words a week, more or less. And some of you gave me very interesting feedback saying that for you, it varies. It goes up and down. And I know some writers do it this way, you know, like you have your your big heavy weeks that do really well. Um, you know, maybe you get a 5,000 word day and then the next a 1,000 word day. And some of you are, are very happy with that, which is great because what's the mantra here? Figure out what your process is and own it. What works for you is most important. For me, I am always going for sustainable creativity. Um, whether or not that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, right now I'm, I'm thinking, I'm pausing and thinking, uh, is that a good idea? I decided I need a little bit more light. So is there a reason that I think that's a good idea? And I may have to go back and reevaluate that, but And now, now I really am thinking about it. I arrived at that a long time ago when I first started writing novels, when it occurred to me that I could not work in creative bursts, which had been my habit when I was writing short. Um, one thing I started to do early on in my writing career was I went to working four 10 hour days at my day job. I was working for an environmental consulting firm. And so I would work from um, like seven to six, taking an hour to lunch for lunch. And then I took Fridays off so that I could have a full day on one day a week in order to write. It's funny, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. When I talk about things I did early in my career, I always talk about the writing every day. I did that first where I got up very early in the morning so that I could write for an hour every day at the same time every day just to build the writing habit. And it worked for me. I didn't want to do that. I resisted it, but it did work to start running the water through the pipes. But then later, especially when I had the the career type job <laughs> for the environmental consulting firm, 
it um, it start and and I'd switch to writing novels that I realized I couldn't. Oh, maybe I hadn't switched to writing novels yet. That might have been part of it because I was writing short. I was writing primarily essays. And so what I would do is I would think about them all week. And these were like 1,500 word, 3,000 word essays. And I would think about them all week and then write them in one big burst. Which, you know, that, that worked for me. However, when I started really getting into writing novels and trying to figure out how to write a novel, um, you know, like that first one took me forever to write, it felt like. And I think I was doing the Fridays working on that too. Uh, I, I It's hard to remember. That's funny. Yeah. What ended up happening later was once I started getting book contracts, traditional publishing contracts, and I had to write to deadline and I had to figure out how to write to deadline that I kind of had a big come to Jesus meeting with myself. It, I feel like maybe I'm not supposed to say that. It's, uh, you know, I come from a, a lapsed Catholic family. So when we talk about the come to Jesus meeting, we say it with a meeting. We say it with a lot of irony. But when I've said it lately to people, they kind of give me a funny look. And I wonder if it's just like, you know, the Christian stuff is just like so not funny anymore. But that's what we mean in my family is the come to, come to Jesus meeting is uh, when you have the hard talk and you have to like repent of your sorry ways and do better. Maybe it's just like this weird lapsed Catholic thing and people don't understand what I mean when I say it. Anyway, so I had this meeting with myself and one thing that has always been true of me or at least I believed to be true, which is an important distinction, was I felt like I didn't work very hard at stuff. All through school, everything, people were always telling me how, my teachers and so forth, that I wasn't really applying myself. And they would be like, you know, you're so smart, but you're just coasting. Um, High school, college, grad school, they all said the same things to me. And even in my early work, and and it didn't matter that I could get, you know, A's, you know, ace the exam or, you know, do whatever, uh, you know, get all of my work done. I could get more work done than anybody else. It was that I didn't appear to be working hard enough. So now we're delving into my psychology. This is like a, a weird thing that I've wrestled with most of my life where People are always telling me that I don't work hard enough. Now, oddly enough, now people tell me I work all the time. My mom even said something to me about that when we were there last weekend. You work all the time. <laughs> it's like, which is it? But anyway, so when I had the come to Jesus meeting with myself, I thought, okay, if you really want to do this, if you want to be, write novels and make a living as a writer, then you have to figure out how to work incrementally over time. You're not going to be able to do this big bursts of creativity. And so that's where I came up with all of this um, sustainable creativity. I, I want to figure out a way to work very consistently. And, and to be fair, this has worked well for me over time. And so I'm just tweaking it. And I had gone down to 2,000 words a day, which felt very easy. It was great. And it was really nice when I was done writing that I still had mental bandwidth to deal with other stuff. And I've actually been making inroads on my to-do list instead of feeling like my to-do list is billowing. So I'm I'm feeling at a very happy place. Uh, In order to get The Storm Princess and the Raven King out, released on May 31st, I want to have a certain amount of time to go back and revise it and make sure that I get everything right the way I want it to be. And in order to give myself that revision cushion, I I could get it written 
at 2,000 words a day, but there's like no buffer. So I thought, okay, well, since this feels easy, I'm going to take it up a little bit to 2,500 words a day, five days a week and see how that feels. So, so far it feels okay. So far it feels good. Um, you know, the, the proof, the test is how it feels in the long term. And I still have mixed feelings about taking time off between books because it definitely sets me back so far as the training, as being in shape to produce words at a particular rate. Um, so, so I don't know. I don't know on that. But I'm feeling very excited about these next book projects that I want to write. So I kind of want to get this book written and move on with my life. But I'm also really liking the book. Um, it's it's different. I say that on every book, don't I? This one's different than I expected. Um, but in some ways, this one is... It's surprisingly romantic. I think it's the most romantic of this particular series. Uh, I don't, I feel like I don't always go in for the full swooning romance, but um, this particular book with Lena and Ryan, they are, uh, well, they've got this, this tortured love, right? So anyway, that's where I'm at with things. Um, so my sticky note from yesterday that I never got to, uh, we've been watching, and I mentioned this before, uh, the HBO miniseries Winning Time, Story of the LA Lakers, and really liking it a whole bunch. Watched the most recent episode on Sunday night. Uh, I've recommended it before. I'm still recommending it. Uh, Jason Siegel. John C. Riley, a bunch of great people in it. Um, Sally Field. <laughs> I think Sally Field's really enjoying this particular role. Um, but it's it's interesting because I mentioned that over the weekend I you know met up with the writers and sat at dinner next to Melinda Snodgrass and we talked about shows we were watching and everything. And I suggested this one and she said, Oh, I don't like sports stuff. I don't watch sports stuff. And I thought, well, okay, fair enough. And I've been known to say the same thing, but, and I have been the one to scoff when people are like, Oh, but sports are a metaphor. Um, you know, like I feel that way about the, I have war movies, like men bonding in war movies just doesn't do anything for me. And I don't care if it's a metaphor for the human condition or whatever. Um, you know, if that's the only way men can figure out how to be friends, I'm sorry. <laughs> Callous of me, but there we are. But in this case, there is, this is such a well-written script that there's actually not all that much basketball in it. And it's about this trying to create a thing, trying to make a thing happen, which is a story that is always fascinating to me. Overcoming um, just all kinds of terrible luck, <laughs> all kinds of stuff happens. And trying to make this a winning team so that, you know, because John C. Riley um, plays this uh, character boss who has like, pretty much staked his entire fortune and there's going to be all these repercussions if, if they can't pull this out. So there are all sorts of really interesting conversations about winning, what it means to succeed. And I, I really appreciate these takes on things. And I wonder how much they are influenced by Ted Lasso, which is another sports show that's not really about sports. Uh, and I hope that, uh, I didn't ask Melinda if she watched that. But, you know, there are similar themes in both. It's about what exactly are you trying to accomplish? Uh, Ted Lasso 
the coach uh, played by Jason Sudeikis is very interesting in that he says things like um, like he doesn't think that it's important whether or not they win or lose the game that what matters is how they play it which you hear a lot it's a little bit of a cliche probably but he he actually believes it and has it come through uh, in the winning time in the Lakers story it's critically important that they win that they're going for winning this championship in order to uh, not lose it all uh, lose all the money and have the team I don't know fall apart what have you. And it's um, it's interesting because in both shows even though the stated goals and the stakes are very different there's still that underlying wrestling with what does it mean to succeed and maybe that's the same thing that I'm talking about with with word count or what I talked about yesterday with trying to evaluate like are you doing good work are you growing are you stretching are you succeeding uh, you know su- success is such a fraught concept there's so many ways to measure it but a lot of it has to do with what are you, why are you doing this thing in the first place and that's something about being a writer that um, you know there's easier ways to make money. <laughs> you have to be doing it for the right reasons uh, and those they're your own right reasons doing it because you love it. Uh, there are a couple of characters in winning time like the former coach Jerry West who's like won't leave he resigned his coach and yet he's still hanging out and and he's like he can't get away from the game because he loves the game. Uh, you know and there's there's a lot of focus on Magic Jock Johnson who is a rookie um, in his very first season and then and there are older players like Kareem Abdul Jabbar are on the team and you know Magic is wrestling with growing up but also with you know trying to play professionally and why is he doing this what what is he trying to accomplish and there is this great bit in this episode on Sunday where he meets Dr. J who I don't recall ever hearing before but you know I don't really follow sports and I was young for a lot of this but Dr. J was playing for the um, Philadelphia 76ers I believe not that it matters but Magic Johnson goes there you know they have a, a game and they meet he meets Dr. J at a party and he and his girlfriend Cookie are you know meet him and and Magic's trying to be all cool and she's like I know that guy I saw his face on the posters on your bedroom wall because you know they were boyfriend girlfriend in college and stuff and and he's like yeah yeah it's not a big deal and she's like it is a big deal. And it is about you know meeting your heroes is such a big deal because you do this and, and we do this as writers right you you grow up reading the books by these people and you feel like you know them you feel like they're your friends in a way and in the show Dr. J is very friendly to Magic Johnson uh, he you know invites him to a party in his room him and Cookie and the and his wife is really sweet to Cookie very welcoming you know and uh, sort of being admitted to the uh, the inner circle which is big too right when you're coming up as a writer and you meet these established writers and they sort of admit you to the circle that's a level of success right because you're like oh I get to hang out with such and so and this is amazing and I, and I often say one of the best perks of being a writer is that you 
get to make other writers be your friends uh, in the way that you only imagined they were when you were reading your their books and even when they then meet on the court uh, there's this sort of extraordinary moment where dr j comes over and embraces magic johnson and he calls him young blood and he's like you ready to play this game young blood and and it, magic's all happy and and i even commented to david i said it's so nice to see you know like an established person in the field an established pro be welcoming to the the rookie and and then dr j proceeds to slaughter him on the court uh and it, it feels like a betrayal because he magic thought he was his friend and i think it's jerry west comes and says to magic johnson later you know i've seen him do this to other people you know, this is, this is a thing that he does where he makes you think that he's your friend. And then he uses that against you. It was like, Oh, Oh, burn. But the thing is, is this happens in the writing world too. I don't know if, if I've ever experienced that particular thing, but certainly there have been plenty of times when I have met my literary heroes, writers whose books I admired so much. And then they, turn out to be total assholes. And, you know, when people say that I am, and, and this is my favorite thing, when people describe me as being generous or um, kind, I, it means so much to me because, because that's who I want to be. I want to be generous and kind to the younger writers because there were a few, that, I mean, there were plenty of writers who were generous and kind to me and uh, continue to be, and I am grateful for them, but there were a few who were not, and it's so shocking. And it's something that we talk about a lot. It's like, should you meet your heroes? Because when you meet your heroes, there is always that possibility that you will be disappointed in them. Um, and that they will be unkind to you. Because one thing about people, and maybe about writers in particular, um, I don't know if it extends to uh, basketball players or other types of creators, but that ego is fragile and they are forever insecure. And there are some who will look at the young blood and see that person coming for their career. Um, instead of being instead of realizing that they were the poster on the bedroom wall, the book on the shelf, the inspiration that this rookie wants to just bask in being around them, they see them as the young predator coming up to take a bite out of them. And it's unfortunate, but it's something to brace for that there will be some who will do this. And it's, um, like I said, shocking and, and crushing on a deep level. And I love that they showed it in this show, sports metaphor or not. On that note, I am heading off to work on my own books. Hope you all have a great Tuesday and I will talk to you on Thursday. You all take care. Bye-bye.